HR issues can kill you. One complaint against your company can turn your world upside down. And you spend way too much time dealing with HR when you should be spending your time on making a profit. You should talk to Bambi. With Bambi, get access to your own dedicated U.S.-based HR manager starting at just $99 per month. They get to know you and your business while providing HR expertise and the personal touch you need and want. They're available by phone, email, and real-time chat, so onboarding and terminations run smoothly. Team members reach peak performance, and your business stays compliant with changing HR regulations. And with Bambi's HR Autopilot, you'll automate important HR practices like setting policies, training, and feedback. HR managers can easily cost 80 grand a year, but Bambi starts at $99 per month. Schedule your free conversation today to see how much Bambi can take off your plate. Go to Bambi.com right now and type in Accelerate under podcast when you sign up. It'll really help the show. Spelled BAM, B-E-E dot com. Bambi.com. Type in Accelerate. Full send with the driver? Check. Piercing iron through the wind? Check. Low checker, high spinner, flop to a tight pin? Check, check, and check. No matter which shot you need to pull off, there's one ball that's better for them all. The all-new TP5 and 5X from TaylorMade. With a newly redesigned dimple pattern, engineered for more distance, more control around the green, and better stability in the wind, it's the hottest tour ball in golf. So no matter what shot you face, there's one ball that's better for all. The TP5 and 5X from TaylorMade. Welcome to Accelerate Your Business Growth with your host, Diane Helbig. Diane is a leading small business development and leadership coach, author, and speaker who is passionate about sharing valuable ideas, tips, and techniques with business professionals worldwide. Diane brings you the world's experts and gurus in all things business, whether it's sales, structure, social media, planning, or plateauing, guests bring their expertise and energy to each episode. When growing your business is your focus, Accelerate Your Business Growth is the show to listen to. Got a topic or guest suggestion? Let Diane know. The goal is to make sure you have the information you need to move your business forward. Thanks for joining us. Settle in and enjoy. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining me. Today's podcast is sponsored by audible.com. Head on over to audibletrial.com slash business growth and sign up for a free trial of audible.com where you can explore not only the audiobooks, but also all of the other audio content that they have. I think uh, if you haven't checked it out before, I think you're going to be pretty amazed. Over the years, the Accelerate Your Business Growth podcast has uh, gained recognition as a great resource for small business owners, sales professionals, business leaders of all kinds. And that is because of the guests. These are folks who um, have expertise in particular areas of business, and they join me to share that expertise with all of you. Today is no different. Today, my guest is Jeff Shore. Jeff is founder and president of Shore Consulting, specializing in field-tested and proven consumer psychology-based sales training programs. He's a top-selling author, host of the popular sales podcast, The Buyer's Mind, and an award-winning keynote speaker. He teaches salespeople how to climb inside the mind of their customers to sell the way their buyers want to buy. Using these modern game-changing techniques, Jeff Shore's clients generated over $30 billion in sales last year. Thanks so much for joining me today, Jeff. It's a pleasure, and thanks for having me very much. This this will be some fun. Yes, it will. It absolutely will. So um, in your book... You talk about, uh, in one of your books, uh, you talk about the idea of resistance a lot. Yeah. And I would love it if you would define that and talk about why it's so important when dealing with follow-up. 
Sure. Yeah. I mean, it is important, I think, in dealing with a lot of different things. But but I first came across the term, I was reading Stephen Pressfield's book, uh, the, the War of Art, really fascinating little book, e- easy to read, but very challenging. And uh, he, it, the book was written for artists, painters, writers, people who deal with uh, writer's block, painter's block. And he uses this term resistance as almost as mythical force that's out to get us. And it's that, that part of us that's that's within that says, oh boy, that's uncomfortable. Therefore, I don't want to do it. And the resistance comes along and says, yeah, don't worry about it. You don't have to do this. It's not that that big a deal. And the resistance is so kind that it even makes up an excuse as to why we shouldn't do it so we can feel better about ourselves and sleep at night. So so it, it's really a, a, a human problem. It's not certainly just in the sales world. When When things are potentially uncomfortable, the resistance rears its ugly head and says, no, 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 I got a better way for you. Just don't do it at all. So that's, that's, I, I, if I'm going to write on follow-up, which is a a skill that many sales professionals are not particularly good at, uh, and they find uncomfortable, then I had to just hit what the sore spot is. And I think that's what, I think that's right there. Resistance is that sore spot. Okay. So I'm, I'm curious about, because I totally agree with you that salespeople are really bad at follow-up. What, why do they resist that? What is it about the follow-up that is so uncomfortable? Yeah, that's a great and important question because what we see here is that that's got to be rooted in something, right? And so uh, what's yeah. going to happen is that we're going to look at it and we're going to think, okay, uh, as a consumer, when have people tried to call me? And they, we, are, we are, minds immediately go to telemarketers, right? People are going to just do nothing but annoy me and interrupt my, my dinner hour. And I'm suggesting to sales professionals, don't be that person. If you're annoying, you shouldn't be calling in in the first place. So if you're not going to provide value in the service of some kind in the follow-up, the idea of calling and just saying, just checking in, seeing if you're ready to buy because I've got a you know a visa payment coming up. Uh, you're not doing that for them. You're doing that for you. So I think that that's where that that yeah. comes from that sense that uh, it's that fear of intrusion marketing and the fear of being not liked. But I would argue if you are adding value, if you're legitimately adding value, there's nothing to be afraid of. You're doing something that your customer will actually rather appreciate. Uh, it, it, so the planning process then is really, really critical because otherwise you're going to do that, you know, what my friend art subject calls parole officer follow up, just checking in. So yeah, nobody likes that. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I, I love this because I think it's so important for salespeople to shift their thinking away from, I have to sell you something to, I need to learn about you. I need to find out what really matters to you and then be helpful to you so that we're building a relationship that makes sense where you want me around because I bring value to you. That, that's right. And, and I would broaden that. I, I wouldn't just say to salespeople, I think any small business owner who's looking at it and has the opportunity where, you know, somebody is thinking about buying something, a product or service of any kind whatsoever, just reaching out and letting them know, you know, I was thinking about you and I, I, I thought, yeah, I remembered this and I wanted to send it along. And have you considered that over here? If you just stop, brainstorm a little bit and ask what problems do my customers have that they don't even know they have? How can I solve problems that, that yeah. they don't even know they have right now? Talk about being valuable and a, and a, a real uh, trusted advisor. I think that's when you play that role, when, when you're solving problems that your customer doesn't even know they have. Well, that feels like then you really have to be listening pretty actively and without an agenda in order to be able to pick up on what's really going on with them. Yeah. And if you're not, then you're, I'm sorry, you're not a good salesperson. <laughs> if you're, if you're not yeah. listening actively, <laughs> you don't have to apologize. <laughs> yeah. Okay. <laughs> if your product is all about your product, you, you got a problem because ultimately your product is nothing more and nothing less than the solution that's going to improve their life. But it's about the customer. Yeah. It's not about your product. And so if we look at it from that perspective, 
uh, you, you, you're selling shovels. That's great. But what they really need is a hole. So why? Why do they need the hole? Let's figure that out first, and then we'll determine whether the shovel is the right solution. Yeah, right. Boy, that's great. Talk to me about comfort addictions. Yeah. Well, I wrote a whole book about comfort addictions so many years ago. Uh, and, and that really started, Dan, because for me, I recognize my own comfort addict tendencies, right? And I see it in my life. I mean, I, I can make entire decisions according to what's comfortable. So, you know, my, my, my elliptical is uncomfortable. My sofa is comfortable, right? <laughs> Broccoli uncomfortable, cheeseburger <laughs> yeah. comfortable. So I can, make yeah, I can make entire life decisions according to what I find most, most comfortable, but I'm not gonna live the life that's healthy and that's best for me. And so I think a lot of people in the world of sales is, so you, you know, we hear people from time to time who will say, oh, I can't be in sales. I tried it once, I was horrible at it. And I don't think it means that they didn't have a nice personality or that they weren't intelligent. It's nothing like that. It's just, they couldn't handle the discomfort. And I think the best sales professionals out there, they recognize you're going to feel discomfort. How you respond to the discomfort is what's critical because that comfort, that discomfort can be a, a trigger that causes me to want to lean into it. And I've learned myself, even over the last several years, personally and professionally, that when I lean into that, which I find uncomfortable, that's when I live my best life. And so, so if, you, if you back off at every sign of discomfort, you're never going to be helpful. I mean, imagine, yeah. uh, you know, a, a, a physician, your, your own doctor saying, well, you know, I, I, don't, I don't want to tell you what you should do. I mean, I, I just give you information and I let you decide. That's not what I want from my doctor. I want my doctor to tell me, regardless of whether it's pleasant or not, exactly what the issue is and exactly how it needs to be solved. Yeah, and, and you can't grow unless you can face your, the, those comfort addictions and, and really you know, acknowledge that this is where you are, but if that's where you wanna go, you're gonna have to feel that that's one of the ways you know you're growing is being uncomfortable. That is, that is so wise. You know the best, I think the best analogy there is weightlifting. If you wanna get stronger, you don't get stronger by lifting the same amount of weights. You have to purposely introduce discomfort in order to do it. And I think it's important yeah. for all of us to understand that, that there is no change without discomfort. There is no growth without discomfort. So if you're just tied to staying in the, what's the most comfortable life I can possibly live? Well, I hope you enjoy it because it's not going to get any better. If you want to improve your right. life in any way, in any, in any corner of your life, there's going to be discomfort involved in that. Right. So embrace it. Welcome it. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Boy. Yeah, this is this is really I, I I'm like I have people in my head who I am thinking of as we're having this conversation. Well, you know, it's funny. I I do the same thing. I put people in my head, and then I always go back and say, "Wait a minute, I got me in my head." I I, I know yeah. I still know those areas that I have a tendency towards uh, my own comfort addictions, yeah. and I have to be careful about that because it's just so easy. And the the problem is that when we yield to that desire for comfort, then our brain is so good at making up a rationalizing story of coming along and saying, oh, no, 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 I can help you with that. I'll, I'll, uh, it, it's okay. You know what? Eat the cheesecake. You, 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 uh, you had a hard day and you, you can work out extra hard uh, tomorrow, you know? And, and so the, your, your right. brain is, is constantly, or it, when it comes to making a follow-up call, you know, oh, I don't want to do that. Your brain's going to say, you know, you don't want to do that because that's intrusion marketing and you don't want to sound like a telemarketer. You know what the best strategy is? Just send a form email and call it follow-up. <laughs> Boy, that mind is evil. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, look, it, 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 well, here's the deal. I, I mean, the brain's number one job is to keep us alive, right? So uh, th yeah. there is a certain aspect where we look and we go, our brain is doing us a favor in the sense that, that uh, it, it is constantly looking out for what it thinks is our well-being. The problem is that when we come across discomfort, we mistake it for threat. And we have this heightened threat sensitivity 
to which point our brain will say, run away, get out of this thing however you have to. And so I think you, uh, Dr. Mark Schoen, UCLA psychologist, wrote a fantastic book on this called Your Survival Instinct is Killing You. That very part of the brain that's trying to keep you alive is really preventing you from living the life that you really could live. Wow, that's powerful. Okay, so keeping in line with what we're talking about, if we shift it and we say, okay, what we really need is a growth mindset, what should we know about that as it relates to follow-up? Yeah, uh, Carol Dweck wrote an incredible book a few years back uh, called Mindset and really delineated those people who have a growth mindset from those people who have a fixed mindset. And Fixed mindset people uh, tend to look at it and say, you know, this is all there is and, and I've got to maximize where just within this box that I'm living in right now. Uh, but but there, is a, there are finite resources, finite capabilities, uh, you know, okay, fine, I'm a comfort addict, that's my excuse, so therefore I'm never going to try and do anything differently. People with a growth mindset look at it and say, uh, yeah, there's, there's limitless potential. There are opportunities to be able to step out of, uh, out of where I am right now. So as it relates to sales, as it relates to follow-up, as it relates to anything that we're going to do that could be potentially uncomfortable, people with a fixed mindset will just literally dream up excuses as to why they shouldn't do the very things that they need to do in order to increase their success. And then what tends to happen is that they sort of put themselves in a box and they say, this is the level of performance uh, that, I, that I'm cut out for. This is who I'm supposed to be. There, there, there is a self-limiting paradigm that says, I'm going to produce at this level. I'm going to make this much money. I'm going to be at this spot on the leaderboard. They, they may not verbalize these things, but internally, that's how they're feeling. People with their growth mindset just look at it and say, there's always room. There's always the opportunity to achieve. But if you have that fixed mindset, the, the problem is your actions and behaviors are always consistent with the way you see yourself. And if you see yourself as that, you know, I'm, a, I'm not a great performer, I'm a core performer, then you'll do the things that core performers do and not the things that great performers do. If you see yourself as that great performer, then your actions and behaviors follow suit. So that growth mindset is critical to overcoming the very discomfort that would otherwise hold you back from being all that you can be. I see. Okay. That makes sense. Okay. This is something that I have been dying to ask you about because you have a chapter in your book that is exclusively devoted to speed in follow-up. Yep. And right. you say it's a superpower. Okay. You yep. got to explain this to me. <laughs> well, it shouldn't be a superpower, but it is simply because it's, it's, it's low hanging fruit that never gets picked. So uh, I'll just give you a real, real uh, easy example right here. Uh, suppose somebody is selling uh, solar panels. Now that's a very competitive industry. And if somebody is going to go out there and think about going solar, getting solar powers or solar panels, they're probably going to talk to three or four different uh, suppliers that are all going to put out bids. And they think they're going to make their decision based on who gave them the lowest bid. Ultimately, they're going to make their decision based on how they feel. The money is going to be part of it for sure, but ultimately they're going to make an emotion-based decision. So I just finished a presentation with a couple in their home talking about solar panels, and we had a great time, a good chat. As it so happens, uh, you know, they've got a Jack Russell Terrier, and I used to have a Jack Russell Terrier, and, you know, we've, we've both been to San Sebastian, Spain, or whatever it is. You have those points of connection, and, and we just had a, a, a great chat. So now what happens? I, I leave, I get in my car, I pull out my cell phone. I haven't even left their driveway. And I send them a text message that says, you know what, I talked to a lot of people in the course of my week, but I have to tell you, I really enjoyed that conversation. I've got some homework for you to answer those questions and I knew, know you wanted to look over the material that I sent. So I'm gonna call you back tomorrow morning between 10 and 11 and we'll be able to take it from there and I'll, I'll show you what I've learned in the meantime. But thanks again, that was a great chat. So what did I just do? I let them know that they were special. I let them know that I appreciated the conversation. I extended this by confirming what the next appointment is going to be. I proved to them that I'm a nice guy and I put my phone number into their phone. All of that for 30 seconds of time at no cost. And it's all about speed. I think one of the cr classic mistakes that salespeople make is they simply wait too long. 
And if I could expand on that just a little bit, the reason yeah. that that's so important is that when we're making a purchase decision, we are emotional creatures. We make decisions out of our emotional core. As much as 85% of the decisions that we make are made out of our emotions versus our logic. So what happens then is our, what I refer to as emotional altitude, our emotional altitude is very, very high while we're in the active process of shopping, of looking, of evaluating. That's when our emotional altitude is high. As soon as that process ends, the emotional altitude begins to wane. And the longer time, the more time that elapses after that emotion, that, that emotional altitude that took place in the conversation, the more the emotional altitude wanes. 24 hours later, 48 hours later, what's happened? Life has happened. Things have gotten in the way. Things are occupying your customer's brain and they just simply forget about you. So the quicker we get back to them, the quicker that we initiate that follow-up, the more we catch them while that emotional altitude is still very, very high. Does that make sense? Oh my gosh, it really does. It does. I never would have uh, thought about it that way or framed it that way, but that makes perfect sense. So then if you look at so, it and you, like, I, you know, I just have a, one quick example. We bought, you know, we're, sure we not. bought a quarantine dog. Okay. And uh, we bought the dog virtually. We bought the dog by video. But what happened was that after the seller introduced us to the dog on a video chat, here's Brody walking around. Here's Brody on heel. Here's Brody on stay. Here's Brody interacting with other dogs. Here's Brody just having fun. So we did all of this live. But then after we hung up the phone and we were just, oh, we love Brody, we love Brody. Uh, what did she do? She filmed another video. It was probably 10 minutes just following Brody around, just watching Brody and just seeing what he is like. And so 10 minutes after our video chat, we get this other video. How many times, Dan, do you think that we watch that video? Oh, right? my gosh. I mean, and, Seriously? <laughs> and then what happened was, what did it do? It reignited the emotional altitude every time we watched the video. So by the time it was time to make the decision on which, by the way, was a costly dog, uh, it was a no brainer because emotionally we were so locked in. Wow, that's a great example. That is a great example. And one of the, so one of the things that I really am hitting on with this is that in both of those examples, well, neither of them um, were an email. Right? I mean, even if it was an email, it was a video. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 I, I think email has become the default for salespeople who want to say that they're following up. But it's a, it's, I, I'm not saying email is useless, but the, I think the only appropriate time to send email is if you've got something that's text heavy, a document or a photos or something that needs to send. But even then, it should probably be best if they know that email is coming because I, I, I'm, We've not talked about this, Dan, but I assume you're like me and, you know, we're just overrun with spam email yeah. and, you know, marketing email that uh, we can, I, when I'm looking at my emails, I have one finger hovering over the delete key. I cannot delete emails fast enough. And uh, I, I'm not Definitely. saying email has no point in follow-up, but is not the primary point of follow-up. The problem is it is the number one usage of follow-up is email. And it's also the least effective. Why? Because it's comfortable. This is what we talked about earlier. It's, it's, if you give into your comfort addiction, you say, I'm not going to make a phone call or shoot a video. I'll just send an email because it's most comfortable. Yeah, it's also least effective. Yeah. It's so weird. We, we do this thing where we do, the, we do the thing that doesn't work because we tell ourselves that it's the best way to do it, even though we know from our own experience that we don't get the results we want. Right. That's correct. Wow. Silly. And yet, salespeople do it every day, all day long. <laughs> um, all day long. Well, and that's the thing. <laughs> all I, day I, long. You know, I had, I had a salesperson who, I just saw this last week, a salesperson was, he, he, he showed me an example of what he's doing. He's working with a prospect and He's actually walking through a Home Depot and the prospect just jumps into his brain, picks up his smartphone, records a video. And he just says, hey guys, I, 
I was, I don't know why, but I'm walking through Home Depot and I was just thinking about your situation. And one thing that I don't think we discussed that might be interesting. Now, quite frankly, I don't even remember what he brought up, what the, what the, the solution is that he was throwing in there. Yeah. But what message was he sending right there? First of all, that this is a relationship. This isn't a, uh, a salesperson yeah. trying to get something out of them. And there's a relationship here. Second, I'm thinking about your situation uh, even maybe when you're not thinking about the situation, I'm trying to figure out how to solve problems that you may not even know you have at this point. And then, you know, what, what happens? He's, he's, he's reigniting the emotional altitude in the very relationship. It's, it, was a, it was beautifully done. And what did it take? 30 seconds to pull out his smartphone and just say whatever right. was on his mind and text that uh, video over to his customers. That's the idea. It's a it, it's a great way to be able to both enhance the relationship and to move the sale along. And this feels like, so you, you say the follow-up should be a service to your customer and that yeah. this feels like that's what you mean when you say that. Is that fair? That's correct. Yeah. So what problem does my customer have that they don't know they have? You know, if you're, if you're selling, whatever, boats, okay? Uh, I'm selling boats, that's an emotional purchase, but somebody has to think about it, they can't make the decision right now, whatever it is. Great, just sit down and brainstorm. What does a potential boat owner, boat owner want to know? Not just about this boat, but about where are the most popular lake destinations uh, within 100 miles of where you are right now? And what's the process for getting uh, permits for different lakes? And what, what is the, the uh, preferred ski brand for somebody who's just starting out along those lines? Or, or where, where is the best fishing uh, in, in this area? And, and where, is there a boat owner's club out there or a website resource for people who can chat about how to take care of their boat? And here are 25 different YouTube videos that th boat people who own this very brand of boat have posted to tell you about their boat. Look, we can provide service all day long simply by brainstorming what might my customer want to know. And then the message that I'm sending to the customer is, I'm solving problems that you don't even know you have. It doesn't take long. It just yeah. takes a little bit of intentionality. That's all. That's exactly, and it's and it doesn't take money. It, it's no, that's right. It's it's changing your mindset. That's right. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, when you look at at the videos that we can produce right now for free, this video was you know ten years yeah. ago. That video cost you a few thousand dollars to put it together. Uh, now you can do it for free off your smartphone in less than thirty seconds. And any marketing person will tell you, high impact, no cost, minimal effort. That's generally something we would favor, wouldn't it? You would think. Video should not be cutting edge, but it absolutely is. Yeah, yeah. People avoid it. Of course, this is one of those comfort addictions, too. They don't want to be on you camera. Right. That. That's right. Yeah, yeah. although I, you yeah. know what I say? People say, I don't like the way I look on camera. And I would just counter and say, that's what you look like. That's just... <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that's just what you look like. I mean, come on, you, you know, it, but it's just that discomfort of, of, as you say, it's the discomfort of, of something that's foreign to him. But once again, when we think about comfort addictions, how do you overcome a comfort addiction? Well, you lean into it. And after a while, it's not uncomfortable yeah. anymore. You just keep doing it over yeah, and over right. again, and then it's no longer uncomfortable. But I think we don't want to go yeah. that far. And, and that's why we get stuck in these ruts. Yeah, it's uh, and I knew you were going to say that. That's what you look like. It's just it's so true. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I love that. Oh my goodness. Oh, okay. I have to. I'm going to take a quick sponsor break and then I want to sure. continue the conversation. The Accelerate Your Business Growth podcast is thrilled uh, to be sponsored by Audible.com because we love Audible.com. And we love Audible.com not just for the audiobooks, but for all of the other. Uh, content that is available to us, like podcasts and Audible Originals and guided meditations and so much more. It is uh, really, I think one of the biggest benefits is that you can find all of those different things on one platform. So it's a time saver because you don't have to go from one to another. You can just find everything that you're looking for in one place. And I'm all about efficiency. So that 
just works really, really well. And I think you're going to find that too. So we're offering a free trial. You can go to audibletrial.com slash business growth, sign up for the trial, and just explore. Look at the thousands of titles of audiobooks that are there and all the different genres. And then pop into a guided meditation. Check it out. Check out the Audible Originals. You know, it's content you're not going to find anyplace else. And just see what resonates with you. Today we're speaking with Jeff Shore about what to do when your prospect says not yet. Now, I, I think I know the answer to this, Jeff, but I'm going to ask it anyway because I just really can't wait to hear your answer. It's a two-part question, and it's why do so many people have telephobia, and how do they get over it? Uh, well, first of all, you're talking to somebody with telephobia. So <laughs> let's start there. Uh, okay. uh, it's a thing. Telephobia is a thing. It, it, you can, it gets listed in psychological textbooks under cognitive errors. Um, it's, and some would suggest that you know, your issues with telephobia might date back to your earliest memories. And uh, I can remember I was in, I think it was what the first grade or the second grade when my mother got a call that her mother, my grandmother had passed away. And I remember the trauma of that call. It's one of the earliest memories I have about the telephone. And who knows if that later uh, uh, led to my own telephobia issues that I had to deal with. But it, like anything else, it's a comfort addiction, right? I'm just, I'm a face-to-face -face guy. I, I prefer face-to-face -face conversations. That's what I would always tell myself along those lines. So I, I, it is a thing uh, that, that people struggle with. But here's what I would counter to that. There are, it's not that you don't have permission to be uncomfortable in, in any way in the sales process. It's a question of what you do when you are uncomfortable. And great salespeople have the trait of high achievement drive that allows them to overcome those discomforts. So while I will say that, yes, I've got some telephobia, I will also tell you that um, I have a high achievement drive. I, I, I'm, I, I need to win. <laughs> and that, that has helped me through my sales career to trump the telephobia meaning it's not as difficult to make the call because it's something that I recognize that, that I have to do. So there is a leaning into this that I think is a, a, a big part of it. But in regards to what you do with the telephobia, I think that the key here is that the best way to do that is to schedule your telephone time in advance. Make the decision, not just of when you're going to make calls, but, and this is, it's, it's going to sound a, a little different, but stay with me on it. Not just when you're going to make your calls, but how you're going to feel when you make your calls. And this is something called cognitive behavioral therapy. It's used by psychologists in treating people with addictions. And right now we're talking about a comfort addiction. You can not only plan what you're going to do, you can plan how you're going to feel while you do it. You can plan in advance for your discomforts. The key is to plan before you're uncomfortable. So when I make that time, when I set what I call the lead conversion hour, when I block off that time in my calendar, there's an hour's worth of time where I'm going to be making all those follow-up calls. I'm going to be making a lot of phone calls. That's what I will be doing in that time. When I block off that time, I can both set up what calls am I going to make, but also take that time to mentally picture, to envision, how am I going to feel strong and confident? So there's some, look, your mind is trying to play tricks on you. So play tricks right back. Own it. You, I, I think it's possible. I, I don't think it's possible. I know it's possible uh, if you can get in front of this and not to be victimized by your own mindset. That, that is so interesting. Okay, so you put yourself in that place. You think about it. You think about how it's going to feel. And if I'm hearing you correctly, then over time, you get used to feeling better about it than maybe where you started. Uh, yeah, that's correct. Uh, over time, you um, you get to the point where you well. Here's what happens: when we face that uh, that discomfort, when we're thinking about something that is uncomfortable to us, then our brain puts puts us on alert, um, puts us on alert, and then what happens is that that threat sensitivity that I was talking about earlier kicks in, and because the brain doesn't want to be uncomfortable then what the brain tends to do is something called catastrophizing. So in catastrophizing, what we do is we think about what the worst possible outcome of something is, uh, 
And we play that in our mind. And the emotional response to that worst possible outcome is so severe that our brain says, yeah, see, you don't want to do that because this could end really, really badly. So if you think back for me, thinking way back to uh, my dating life, will I ask this young woman for, for a date? In my mind, what's going to happen? There's going to be this catastrophizing that goes on. And I'm picturing uh, getting laughed at or getting hit or whatever it is. And then my brain says, you see, you don't want that result. So you probably just shouldn't do it at all. That's catastrophizing. That, that's what happens. So, so if we can recognize that whatever that catastrophizing story that we tell ourselves, it's illogical. It's emotion-based and it's not logical. This is, once again, the opportunity where we have to protect ourselves from our own mind. Our mind is trying to get us to not do things that are actually good for us. And so uh, just to, out of a sense of self-preservation, gone awry. So I need to be able to look at it and say, what's the worst case scenario? If I'm making a phone call, what's the worst case scenario? Somebody hung up on me. Right. Okay. How will I do yeah. with that? I mean, will that put me in a corner in a fetal position? Because if it does, you probably shouldn't be in sales, right? Right. This is what's the worst thing that's going to happen. And by the way, if you're a good salesperson, you have a good relationship with these people. So something went really wrong if they're going to hang up on you. In reality, that's only going to happen if you don't have a good relationship with people. Yeah. And if you don't do follow up, right, because the longer you go, between when you engage with them and then you do follow up, the worse it is. Yeah, that's correct. Huh. Yeah, that's absolutely right. Okay. All right. Now, th the next thing I want to ask you about is something that, that I think there's a, just a ton of debate about and people are on like a lot of different sides and it's scripting. So you write about scripting, and I know you don't really love the idea of scripting. I don't think I do either, but I have found myself creating scripts for my clients, at least starter scripts, because what they say is, I don't know what to say. or I don't know how to answer if I get this question, whatever it is. So how should we think about scripting when it comes to follow-up? Well, I think that the idea here is, um, uh, I'll tell you what I don't like about scripts. First of all, I don't like somebody else's scripts. I don't like somebody writing scripts for me. Uh -huh. So in the book, the last thing I'm going to do is, is write a bunch of scripts and say, here, say this. Now, I do put examples in the book of how I would say it, but I, I'm me, right? So you yeah. got to write it yourself. So I think the better way to look at that is to think in terms of bullet points, rather than scripts. These are the key points that I want to communicate. This is the flow that I want to use in order to do that. And I think that that allows you, you know, nobody in a conversation is going to read bullet points and stop right there, right? It's just a few thought starters for you, but it gives you an arc to that story. It allows you to have some logic to what it is that you're, you're trying to do. Now, if you want to use scripts, that's fine. Just make sure that they're a your own, not something that somebody handed to you and B, uh, you've got to make sure that you're writing the script out loud because the way we talk is not the way that we write. So if you write out a script and say, well, that looks good. Well, yeah, it may look good, but it doesn't sound good. So if you're writing your own script, if you want to do it that way, that's fine. But you have to talk that through out loud and then get somebody else to listen and ask the question, does this sound like me? Because everyone knows when they're being read to. Everybody, they can pick it up in a heartbeat. So if it's not yeah. your voice, if it doesn't sound like you, uh, you're, you're, you're going to lose them. You're going to lose them. Wow, that's so great. Thank you for that. I, I, that. That is just great advice. You mentioned earlier when we were talking about the lead conversion hour. Uh, and, and I would like you to go a little deeper about that. Like, what is yeah. it? Yeah. Yeah, so the lead conversion hour is is that idea of 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 setting we, we, this way we we can we can schedule our time around our our priorities but i i think that the key here is that if we don't know what a priority is then we're never going to be able to do that effectively so it really begins by asking the question what's the single most important thing that i do in the course of a day right as it relates to my sales career what is the single most important thing that i will do 
And if we, to me, the answer to that, if you're in sales is lead conversion, you have a lead, you're trying to convert it, you're trying to turn that lead into into a buyer. So uh, that's the, the, the genesis of the idea of the lead conversion hour, if it truly is the most important thing, then great. Let's schedule uh, around that. So the idea here is, I don't know if you've ever seen the, the uh, diagram or the, the, the video of the person who takes a jar and, and, and they, then they put in, you know, water first, and then they put in sand, and then they put in small rocks. Yeah. And then by the time they're done, they can't fit the big rocks. So you got to put, but you put the yeah. big rocks in first, and then what happens? You put the small rocks in, they fill in the gap, and then the sand, then the water, everything fits. So to me, lead, the lead conversion hour, that's your big rock right? The, the biggest rock that I have is lead conversion. There's nothing more important than I will do than lead conversion. So I schedule that time and I make it sacred. That means nothing competes, nothing takes it off that schedule. It means that everybody around me understands this is my lead conversion hour, go away. Nothing interrupts because this is the most important thing that I will do in the course of the day. And imagine if you're doing that at 9 a.m. And, and you've had 10 significant phone calls by 10 a.m., 10 before 10. How great is that day, right? You've already gotten 10 significant calls already in. You've given time for your customers to, to get back to you. If you got their voicemail, you're feeling confident. Uh, th that's a great way to be able to look at it. So yeah, I do recommend that lead conversion hour discipline. And I recommend that it's done early in the day. Yeah, I love that. Right. Because then even if you didn't get any other thing done, you got the most important thing done. That's right. That's correct. Huh. Let's spend a little bit of time on virtual selling since we are mm -hmm. in this, you know, really strange world uh, that, that yeah. we find ourselves. How do you think that is impacting um, or affecting fo how we do follow up? It, how it how it is or how it should <laughs> uh so you know, <laughs> yeah right okay, that that common sense versus common practice well let me start here uh, i i will tell you that uh you know i have a training company and uh, i've got several trainers that work for me and they go out and they travel all over north america and they deliver presentations well guess what nobody's traveling right now and so we had to move 100 percent of our business online and we have successfully it, it's and it's worked out quite well now, on the one hand, I would look at it and say, like many, many people who are listening right now, I had to pivot in a hurry. I had to figure out in a hurry how we were going to do something that was designed for an in-person uh, opportunity and take it all online. They had to figure out how to take all of our business into a virtual environment. But the interesting thing to me about that story is I, I'm not alone. A lot of people did that. What's interesting to me is how quickly customers shifted to the virtual environment. So just as one simple but really interesting example of that, uh, last December, Zoom video conferencing had 10 million subscribers. As of last month, it had 300 million subscribers. That's growth right there. But what it tells yeah. me is that everybody understands it now. I, I mean, my, my in-laws are age 90 and 89, and they Zoom. Wow. Right. They, they know how to Zoom. They, they, they had a Zoom funeral for a, a cousin up in Canada. Uh, so so wow. everybody knows video technology now, whether it's Zoom or or, you know, Teams or, you know, Google Meet or, 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 or Skype or whatever it is. Everybody understands it. And there's so many different technologies along those lines. But everybody gets something. I mean, I've known how to FaceTime for a long time. Why? Because I have grandkids that don't live near me. So it's, it's, it's what we do. So, so the customers have grown so accustomed to video conferencing that the hang up is more in the minds of the salespeople than it is in the minds of the customers. But it is incredibly powerful. And the reason it's powerful is because of something that I refer to in the book as the hierarchy of communication. The most impactful way, impactful form of communication is face to face because we get nuances, right? We, we can see things and sense things that you're not going to be able to see in any other way. Uh, that, right. If I can't go face to face, what's next? Previously would have said, well, I guess that means it's a phone call. But no, it's not. It's a video call. If I'm communicating yeah. with somebody on video, it's not just the words. It's not just the tone of voice. It's the body language. It's the facial expression. It's the reaction. It's the quizzical look when I say something that they didn't quite understand. 
we pick up so much more on video. This is a fantastic opportunity. And to give you a sense of how powerful it can be, this is a great story. Uh, a salesperson who is talking to a lady, and she's, uh, she sells real estate. She sells new homes, okay? She's talking to a lady, and she's asking this lady, um, hey, you know, tell me about the home you're in right now. What's not working for you? And this is very recently. So this lady says, oh, oh, my goodness. I have to work from home, and I have to do these, con these video conferences or, or, or sometimes just make a, 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 I'm on a conference call, just audio. Well, I've got two kids that I'm trying to figure out how to homeschool at the same time. We have no dedicated space. So when it's time to do this, you know what I do? I go into my master bedroom closet and I close the door oh. and I throw a sheet over the clothes. So there's a backdrop and it's hot and it's sweaty. And that's where I video conference. Now, here's the beautiful part. The salesperson says, oh, my goodness, show me. Show me. I want to see that. I want to see your oh. make fish, makeshift office right now. And the lady does it. She takes her camera. She goes over and she shows her the frustration with the closet. Now, just think about what happened there. Not only did the salesperson end up with a strong understanding of the level of dissatisfaction this lady has in her home, there is a bond that this, that this yeah. lady, this customer now has with the salesperson that she's not going to have with anyone else. I mean, just think about it. Your closet, that's personal space. That's private space, yeah. <laughs> but she shared that because that's how significant the dissatisfaction was. Now that salesperson has a significant leg up and when she's gonna show her a home and show her that dedicated home office that's tucked away from the rest of the home, I'm telling you, she is solving a significant emotional problem and she's the only one who really knows the depth of that problem. That video yeah. calling is great, both because I can communicate with somebody face to face, but I can also uh, be able to both see their current problem and to show them my current solution. All done on video. This is something that we, we would never have been here if not for a global pandemic. But if there's any good <laughs> that's come out of this whole thing, it's the fact that everybody gets video. Yeah, it's the silver lining. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I hope everybody gets video because it's I know, really so, know. Yeah. right, I know, you know, it makes such a difference. Oh my gosh, Jeff, I really appreciate this information and this conversation. It is so important and so timely. Um, and uh, so I thank you and would love it if you would share with the listeners, uh, you know, where they can find your books, how they can find you, whatever you've got going on. Sure. Well, everything is easy. Just go to jeffshore.com. It's Jeff Shore, like where the ocean meets the land, jeffshore.com. And there you can get the links to the books. And we do a, a, a free Saturday morning training video every single week. It's, a, it's called our five-minute sales training. You can sign up for that. Anything that you would want to see. There's also a, a, a sales follow-up master class that we offer. I think it's, I don't know, 129 bucks. It's not much, uh, but it allows you to to take the principles in the book and a lot more that we added on for stuff that we couldn't fit in the book, but it takes you through a diligent, dedicated process over time. Just look for the link to the uh, follow-up masterclass. Nice. Wow. Thank you. And listeners, thank you. You are who we are doing this for, and you got some really great information, actionable, you know, we, we all need to work on this stuff. Uh, and I'd also like to thank our sponsor. Uh, head over to audibletrial.com slash businessgrowth. Sign up for the free trial for audible.com and explore everything that's there. See what really resonates with you. As always, continue to prosper and be curious. And until we meet again on another episode of Accelerate Your Business Growth, goodbye and good day. Me, 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 but also you. <laughs> the Pharaoh fast forwards his favorite foreign film. Pip, 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 powder donut. <clears throat> okay, what's my line? Uh, the only line I see here on the script is get options based on your budget with the name your price tool from Progressive. Oh man, that's a tongue twister, huh? I'm sorry, I'm gonna need a few more minutes. <clears throat> bulbous walrus, the bulbous walrus. The name your price tool, only from Progressive. The owl ran afoul of the comatose coxswain. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates price and coverage match limited by state law. Me, 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 but also you. <laughs> the Pharaoh fast forwards his favorite foreign film. Hip, 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 powder donut. <clears throat> 
Okay, what's my line? Uh, the only line I see here on the script is get options based on your budget with the Name Your Price tool from Progressive. Oh man, that's a tongue twister, huh? I'm sorry, I'm gonna need a few more minutes. <clears throat> bulbous Walrus, the Bulbous Walrus. The Name Your Price tool, only from Progressive. The owl ran afoul of the comatose Coxswain. Progressive Casualty Insurance Company and affiliates price and coverage match limited by state law. Hey friends, this is Jim Knight, former 21-year Hard Rock executive turned best-selling author and top 10 keynote speaker. And I'm Brant Menzwar, former frontman of Hollywood's most dangerous band turned top 10 motivational speaker and best-selling author. We host the how-to podcast, Thoughts That Rock, where we talk to rock stars, athletes, CEOs, astronauts, and even next door neighbors who share their expertise and opinions. Together, we tackle the most interesting and challenging topics of today. Whether you want to learn how to become more confident, how to deal with anxiety at work, or how to write a hit song, or use Brazilian Jiu Jitsu in life, we've got hundreds of episodes to help amp up your life and move you forward. Subscribe to Thoughts That Rock wherever you listen to podcasts and check out evergreenpodcast.com for more information.